Sure. Quitting. For their name. Oh, learning. You've seen this presentation before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Emotion. 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 <laughs> Embarrassment. Whoops. Hiding. Whoops. <laughs> Disaster. Disaster. Then said two success. So in my hand here, I am holding uh, the Engineers Without Borders Annual Failure Report. Uh, this is last year's report. It is 27 pages, 14 stories that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Engineers Without Borders failed at least, but probably more than 14 times last year. Knowing that, what comes to mind when you think of this organization? who clearly failed, and, and the people who wrote these stories to be published publicly for everyone to read forever. What words hop into your head when you think of them? Bravery. Bravery. Honesty. Honesty. Risk. Risk. Helpful. Helpful. Confident. Confident. Forward. Forward. I don't agree with Do you notice, uh, do you notice a difference? And those two sets of words? Yeah. What do you want? It's it's really amazing how differently we perceive failure and the experience of failure with how we perceive people and organizations who fail. And it is in that spirit of expanding our perceptions of what failure can mean to us that I was invited here today. And Thank you all for the wonderful invitation. As Alberta mentioned, uh, uh, the failure report was started in 2008. And it was started by a fellow named Nick Jimenez, who was working for Engineers Without Borders in Ghana. And Engineers Without Borders has this uh, organizational value of humility. And Nick was frustrated because he heard that value, he believed in that value being so important to humanitarian work. And yet he didn't see the organization talking about anything but its successes. So he decided to change that. He rallied a few of his friends who wrote up their stories of things that they failed at that year. And being uh, a little bit on the side of rabble-rousing, uh, decided to print out 100 copies of their stories and showed up at the annual general meeting for Engineers Without Borders that year with the first ever failure report, completely surprising the CEO. <laughs> Fortunately, Georgia Parker took it well and recognized that uh, despite their initial misgivings about the, the risk and how funders might react, that the benefits of learning and, and humility and driving that, uh, that culture far away from those risks. So it's now in its seventh year of publication. I'm still helping the team uh, lead, lead the project. And it's really about flipping the idea of failure on its head. You're not wrong if you fail. The only thing that's bad is if you don't learn from it and share that. And you'll notice, if you look at the covers, we have a few versions up here. They all have different covers. And the reason for this is because it's still a grassroots project. A new team builds it every year. I just kind of provide mentorship now. Uh, and how that works, in case you're interested in producing your own failure report by chance, is that we put a call out to the organization. It's super easy. Send it out to every corner of the organization, say, hey guys, send us your failures for the year. And then we get stories back. And stories from every corner of the organization, including the leadership. This here on the screen is a story from the CEO, George, a few years ago. And I bring this up because it's so important to the cultural driving aspect of this report. The fact that this report isn't about just talking about failures, it's about highlighting leaders in the organizations who have tried something and tried a solution to a problem that they didn't know how to solve and it didn't work and they learned something from it and they're sharing that. And the best stories are the ones that get into the report. And in this way, 
it's almost a reward to get your story in the in the failure report. So it really is the are these aspects of of highlighting and recognizing folks that are being innovative and trying new ideas and failing and learning um, that makes this report such an exceptional cultural driver. It makes it so that failures are talked about every time a coach meets with their, their team members, or every time there's a team meeting, failure is discussed. Now, it's not just once a year when the report is published. Now, I, uh, I said it was an incredibly effective cultural driver, but this story up on the screen right now proves without the shadow of a doubt that it's not exactly the most effective learning tool. You'll notice that the title of this story is Failing to Learn from the Failure Report. This is my favorite story published in 2012. And what had happened was this team in 2011 had failed, did a kind of a post-mortem on the failure, wrote a story for the 2011 report, then that same or a very similar mistake was repeated the next year after. So unfortunately, uh, the failure that showed up in, in the 2012 report was about the failure to learn. And, I point this out for a couple of reasons. One, to point out that, yes, this report is good, but it's not perfect. We were working on different ways to make it a more effective learning tool. But also point it out because, to me, it speaks to how exceptional it is at demonstrating the, the spirit uh, that exists within the organization and reinforcing that spirit that allows everyone within their engineers who have orders to ask tough questions and be self-critical and have those conversations and those tough conversations that you can't normally have in an organizational environment. So the only really strict guideline I have um, that I'll turn away a story right away is if it blames someone else. That's pretty much my only criteria. If the story comes in that implicates anyone else in the story, I send it back to the author and I say, awesome story, thanks for sending it in, but you need to co-write this with the person that you implicated in the story. And you can imagine how hard that is, right? Like, think about some of the failures that you've had. You had to go back to the person that was on the other side of it and have a conversation and reach common ground about what actually happened, enough so that you could co-write a story that would be published publicly, and quite often, honestly, those stories don't end up getting published because they can't find a way to describe the failure uh, in a way they're most satisfied with. But those people end up learning way more than the folks that actually get published. Uh, so really, in this exercise, Engineers Without Borders is learning how to learn. It's what Chris Argus refers to as double loop learning. So I'll disambiguate double loop learning from single loop learning. And single loop learning is kind of how we normally think about learning. We mess something up, we learn from it, we don't do that mistake again. Um, double loop learning is recognizing that we can actually get better at that skill of adapting. And how do we ask the right questions and diagnose problems early and analyze and, and adapt in a way that's effective? That's double loop learning. So that's what this report is also really great at. And, uh, we see this in this failure story that I have up on the board right now, uh, where the organization used a quite, a, quite a terrible failure, uh, used it as an opportunity to build resilience into the organizational structure. So this story talks about how last year, um, basically there was a, a confluence of errors of uh, poor cash flow modeling, uh, exaggerated revenue projections, and the uh, turnover in staff in the financial and accounting team that meant that uh, cash wasn't being managed well, they overspent because they were expecting more revenue and nobody noticed for a couple months. And it led to a couple layoffs. Right? Serious, serious failure. Uh, and the organization recognized this, so they brought me in to do kind of a post-mortem on this and try to figure out how this could have happened. So I came in and did, yeah, did interviews with a bunch of people, read a facility, did a bunch of workshops, and basically it came out with 34 recommended action items, uh, which is probably too many that anyone would really want to see. But the important part of this that is that only a handful of those were of the single loop learning variety. As in, okay, so we need, here are the recommendations for how to manage cash flow, here are the recommendations for checkpoints on checking on revenue projections. Um, 
And the rest of them were double loop learning recommendations, as in they addressed the organization as a whole. Because as I conducted the interviews, we found that one of the big reasons why this failure occurred was because many of the team members that should have been speaking up and voicing their concerns weren't because they didn't feel safe doing so. Or they didn't feel like they had enough knowledge about the, the financial implications and how the organization was managing its finances, didn't have the financial acumen to be able to do so knowledgeably. So those were a bunch of the recommendations that addressed core issues of the organization. You know, create a psychologically safe workplace where people feel safe voicing their concerns on any issue and build that into the organization. And that's what I mean by turning failures, serious ones, into opportunities to become a more resilient organization that won't repeat this mistake again, but also will be able to, to detect mistakes faster in the future. And there are three reasons that I've identified in this work of, that allowed engineers and reporters really to use a serious failure and turn that into an opportunity to become stronger. Three factors that really helped them do that. And we're on the board now. They had the norm of talking about failures openly. Every single person I talked to in that postmortem was willing to take responsibility for the failure. Yeah, they had that humility to say, yeah, that's the role I played in. Uh, and then they recognized, as on a broader level, that just telling a story wasn't enough. That they needed to transform that learning into change within the organization. So here I'm going to try to sum up my, uh, all, all of this thinking on what it means to react to failure productively. This is a, a model I built in an attempt to explain my work. The loop is, is basically what it would look like if we were able to react to failure as productively as possible. And the exits are what are more our typical uh, tendencies in times of failure. So for those that like frameworks, this is for you. Um, the, the tendency in time of failure is to react defensively. Happens to all of us. I watch myself react defensively. Even though I talk about this and think about it all the time, I still have defensive reactions when I fail. Um, and the problem is that our, our body is hardwired to react defensively. We have these very strong physiological responses to failure. Perhaps you've noticed them. Face turns red, stomach clenches, shoulders pull down, hands, palms sweat. You know, very, very strong discomforting reactions, which trigger defensive mechanisms in our brain. And that's when we see the blame and uh, self-criticism, avoidance, you know, trying to fix it before anyone notices, kind of defensive reactions to failure. But we do have a choice, and we have a choice to stay on the intelligent failure loop and instead try to maximize our learning. Uh, and as Roberto talked about it at lunch, we're actually quite good at doing this on a personal level, but our organizations tend to not have to build in processes in order to maximize learning. And, and you see that um, in postmortems and after action reviews a lot, and failure reports, in fact. Um, but of course, I already brought it up that uh, failing to learn from the failure report story. I mean, that's a perfect example of when learning was maximized, they wrote the story, but then the same mistake was repeated. Well, that's the exit there. Like that team that did that postmortem learned a lot, but it didn't turn, it didn't translate into structural changes within the organization. But if we stay on that loop, we see huge improvements to our organization, uh, or at least we see the ability to incrementally improve as we go. And that's a good place to get to, to be honest. Uh, that's the learning loop. We know we can, we can try something, and if it fails, we're going to learn and we're going to improve because of it. Great place to get to. But there's one more step on there. And that is the fourth step of informer taking and innovation. And that says, that really speaks to the power of double loop learning, where if we know we can try things, and if they don't go well, we're going to become an even stronger organization because we're going to learn from them and learn how to, to solve the problems we're, we're seeking to solve even better. And we apply that skill across the organization. It allows us to take more risks and more smart risk that we know will push us forward and allow us to adapt into the organization we need to be. So that's uh, that's the intelligent failure loop. I, I really love 
this model. I mean, I built it, I should. Um, but there's one part of it that is I, I'm frustrated with because I can't figure out how to build it into the model, and it's this. It still talks about simply reacting after a failure has occurred. And a, and a friend and mentor of mine once said, uh, we overemphasize learning from a past event and totally underemphasize the importance of learning through current events. If you think about that for a second, you know, if you're just looking at past events, the failures happened. And you can learn from it to not repeat the mistake in the future, but there's not really much you can do at that point. But if we build in the, the processes and the the capacities to learn through events, how powerful that would be for course correction on route. Uh, and what Marilyn Darling is the woman that I, I would refer to, um, she talks about how important it is to anticipate failure, do before action reviews, um, and then schedule in reflections to think about what's going well and what's not and how you can adapt. Uh, and our, our beloved uh, Canadian astronaut, Chris Hadfield, talks about this as well. He calls it visualizing failure. So him and all of his space commanders get together, and they talk about every single thing that could possibly go wrong in their space mission, which you can imagine would probably be a lot of things. Uh, and they go over how they would react to this. And then they get out on their mission, and none of those things go wrong, and a whole handful of other things go wrong. But it doesn't matter, because they've had that conversation. They know how to talk about failure. They're anticipating that failure is a possibility. They have the language to talk about it, and they're ready to adapt and handle it. So that is how I conceptualize my work and admitting failure and failure reports uh, in a 14 minute summary. I want to pause there because the rest of our time together is going to be a lot less of me talking and a lot more of you interacting. Uh, but I want to pause for questions while well, there's sort of a natural break there. I am delighted to move on. Question. Oh, please. You talk only failure, but how about the success stories? Are there any good success stories? Um, yeah, I think the failure report comes out alongside the annual report. And if you've read any company or organization's annual report, it's, it's full of success stories. And that's great. You know, you can learn from successes, too. Um, the failure report is really about recognizing that there's a bunch of conversations that aren't happening, that, that should be happening because they're valuable. But thank you. Um, I'm not sure at what stage this is and, and like the volumes of reports that you're getting, but is there any work in terms of like synthesizing some of that information to, to for lack of a better word, like numbers or like uh, things that you could analyze and I don't know, like mine for information? <laughs> That's a great question. I've been trying for the last, I've been kind of geek. Uh, so having seven years of better reports is like really awesome. Uh, and trying to trend the reports, to try to understand failure modes within the organizations. Um, I recognize that if I did it, I would be biased. So I, I had a handful of folks in trying to look for trends. And every single one of us came up with different trends in how we saw how the failure, why, what was at the root cause of the failure, which um, I don't know what, what what the learning in that is, other than we typically think of failures and fall into this first attribution error, where we think the failures are just caused by one thing, when in reality, that's simply how we tell our stories, that in reality, any failure that's really worth talking about is probably caused by a huge range of factors that you could look at from a whole bunch of different so that was an interesting learning for me. There's a new, I should say, there's a new initiative to try to map out the tensions in the organization that seems a little bit more promising than mapping out trends for failure models. But to be, to be seen. <laughs> One more, yeah. Uh, what is the scale of a failure that can be tolerated? Because in some situations, failures cannot be accepted at all. Mm -hmm. not Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Oh, I've seen a bunch of different scales for failure. Uh, one of my favorite that I talk about a lot is um, Amy Edmondson's blameworthy to put praiseworthy spectrum. And so she talks about how if you have a linear process, 
that you know how to do and you deviate from it, that's on the blame side. Like, you, you just should have known better. <laughs> Uh, but on the praiseworthy side are things like almost all of humanitarian work projects, to be honest, where there isn't a simple solution. You're dealing with uh, complexity and interconnectedness and uncertainty, and all you and you need to test ideas in order to learn. Um, and in testing new ideas, things are going to go wrong, and that's on the praiseworthy side of failure. I also had a, actually speaking to a Harvard prof who spoke about how often his research was on how uh, organizational failures are usually recoverable. You know, you try to build a business, the product didn't work. You know, nobody's you know going to jail over it uh, <laughs> most of the time. Uh, but what happens is people get so desperate to stop that from being a failure that they dip into more personal failures where you end up in Enron scandals, <laughs> things like this. Was basically his point that if we just recognized failure for failure, we wouldn't be tempted to push it into the unrecoverable side. Uh, maybe just just one more, just in the interest of time. It, it's almost like the failure report is a, a, a double loop um, uh, innovation journey, where you have an organization that um, says yes, try some things, we're going to report our successes, and we're going to learn from our uh, uh, mistakes. But it gives the people that work for that or with that organization the opportunity to feel that um, they can try something new, which gives a, 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 an atmosphere of innovation and creativity and an openness to um, dialogue and try, which I think is really, really important. Thanks, John. I, um, if you were talking numbers, one number I do have is over 90% of the people, staff, and volunteers who are now a part of Engineers Without Borders, a big part of the reason that they are a part of the organization is because of the failure report. But that, that's how they heard about the organization and they loved what it represented.